begin with some facts that probably are not going to be very interesting to you. My name is Harold Wilmington. I was born in 1932, uh, occupation uh, for many years, a pastor and a teacher since 1972 here at Liberty. Uh, so my favorite food is hot dogs and peanut butter sandwiches. And one of my favorite hobbies is watching Monday Night Football. I'm married to Sue Wilmington, and I have three grandchildren. Uh, now, what is the purpose of all this nonsense? Well, we're studying the Psalms, and we're looking at the subject matter. We've looked at the penitential Psalms, the imprecatory Psalms, the degree Psalms, the hallelujah Psalms, the historical acrostic, and we concluded yesterday the messianic Psalms. Now, we're looking at the attribute psalms today. And what I've given you, let me give you a definition of an attribute. An attribute is anything that God has revealed about himself in his word. And I gave you four or five attributes concerning myself. So an attribute in the scripture, any fact regarding God's person. But an attribute, any fact concerning God. And there are a number of them, and we want to begin our session now by looking at some of these attributes. Um, his uniqueness, uh, Psalm 115. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. The idols, though, the false pagan gods, are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. They have hands, but they handle not. They have feet, but they walk not. In other words, the psalmist is saying here in Psalm 115 and also in Psalm 135 that our God is a unique God. It goes on to say in the book of Isaiah, uh, God himself says, uh, who can I use, what object can I use to, to compare myself? And there is none because he is the unique, the only God, his uniqueness. And then his holiness. You know, the most prominent characteristic or attribute of God, and there are many, many in the Bible, is his holiness. If you wanted to describe God uh, to an unbeliever, a non-believer, or a Martian in three words, you would use these three words, God is holy. The psalmist says, Exalt ye the Lord our God, and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. So he's unique, he's holy, and he is eternal. The psalmist says, Of old thou hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. There you are the same, thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. He is not only the everlasting God, and he's, of course, that also, but he is the eternal God. And the difference between the eternality of God and the everlastingness of God is that everlasting, well, if you're going to draw an everlasting line, at least you would start somewhere, and then you just never end. You just continue drawing. But you could not draw an eternal line because an eternal line has no and, but it also has no beginning. And so that's why in later on the Psalms, it speaks of God, the eternality of God. It says, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So one everlasting is not enough, but he is the eternal God. No beginning and no end. And then the psalmist speaks of his glory. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name the glorious God, and then his majesty. The Lord reigneth, he hath clothed himself with majesty. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters. His majesty. And that song, worship his majesty. Beautiful, beautiful song. His mercy. Psalm 136 contains the word mercy 36 times. Notice, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. And this little phrase is found in practically every verse for 
His mercy endureth forever. We've described mercy in another lesson, I think, is the difference between grace and mercy. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, and that's heaven. Mercy is getting what you uh, should deserve, and that's hell. So mercy is mentioned here, as I say, 36 times. And then God's goodness. Oh, the psalmist says that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. His justice, arise, O God, the psalmist says in chapter 82, and judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. And someday he shall come to judge the world in perfect righteousness and justice. And then his omnis. Now the word omni means all. And in the Psalms, we read of God's omnipresence. He is all present. That is everywhere at once. Of his omnipotence, he is all powerful. And of his omniscience, that is he is all knowing. And uh, notice his omnipresence, and some of these are found, the omnis are found in Psalm 139. He said, the psalmist says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? And he says, if I go to heaven, you're there. In the grave, you're there. Sometimes I think even the darkness of night shall cover me, but the very night is light to you. There's nowhere that I can go uh, uh, in my sin or whatever circumstances that I will be separated from God. And that's a glorious thing. The omnipresence of God, as far as the believer is concerned, is a frightening thought as far as the unbeliever is concerned. He's everywhere at the same time. He, Folks, he, he knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been good or bad. So you be good for Jesus' sake. His omnipresence. And then his omnipotence. That means his total power. By the word of the Lord, the psalmist says, were the heavens made, for he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Then his omniscience, also in Psalm 139, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thine eyes did see my substance yet unfashioned. In other words, he saw me even as I was developing in my mother's womb. And not only is he omniscient as far as the world, as far as the believer, but as far as the universe. Because the same psalmist, Psalm 147, uh, says, He telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord, and of his great power, his understanding is infinite. The three omnis. And then his providential care. The Bible says that, Thou visitest the earth and watereth it. Thou preparest corn for the animals. Thou crownest the year with goodness. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man. The trees of the Lord are full of saps, the cedars of Lebanon, which he hath planted. Uh, The young lions roar after their prey and seek their meat from God. And all universe and all especially the world itself gives thanks and testimony to the providential care of God, his providential care. And then you have the possession of God psalms. In other words, things that the Bible says God owns, possessions, special possessions. Of course, one is his word. Psalm 119, the Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Forever, O Lord, is thy word settled in heaven. And on and on regarding his word, his most priceless possession. And then his voice. The psalmist says, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. His voice and his wealth. The psalmist says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. He said, I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, Psalm 50, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, 
and the fullness thereof. We think of the, that song, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine, he owns the rivers and the rocks and rills and the sun and stars that shine, wonderful riches more than tongue can tell, tell. he is my father, so they're mine as well. And so all his marvelous, marvelous, marvelous uh, wealth here. And then his city, great is the Lord and greatly to, present, to be praised in the city of our God. God will establish Jerusalem forever. Jerusalem, the Bible says, is built as a city that is compact together, whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. His city, all the cities, present, past, future, the one closest to the heart of God, is the city of Jerusalem because some 2,000 years ago, actually some 3,000 years ago, I should say in the days of David, he determined, I will establish my name in the city of Jerusalem. And then uh, we read of his house. The psalmist says in Psalm 84, for a day and thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. Blessed, he says, are they that dwell in thy house. The house of the Lord. These are possessions of God. And then you have man-related psalms. Psalms depicting various kinds of men. The, for example, the godly man. And that's in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in season. His leaf also not, shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Uh, you have the godly man, and then the other side of the coin, you have the, the godless man. The wicked in his pride, the psalmist says, does persecute the poor. For the wicked boasteth of his heart desires. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Of the fool, the wicked man, has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Therefore, the righteous man will prevail. The wicked man will be scattered as chaff and will not stand in the judgment as will the righteous man. So the good man, the bad man, and then the purpose of man, man-related psalms. David said, when I consider thy heavens, as he one day, perhaps, or evening, was watching his father's sheep on the hills in Bethlehem there, and he looked up and uh, he saw the Little Dipper and the Big Dipper in the mid-eastern sky, and he began to think about uh, philosophical and scriptural matters. He says, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou has ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? What indeed is man? The purpose of man. Well, of course, the purpose of man, according to the, uh, catech according to the Westminster Catechism, is to know God and enjoy him forever. The purpose of man. And then the frailty of man. Lord, the psalmist prayed, make me to know my end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am, the frailty. And then you have the contrasting psalms, uh, <clears throat> opposite psalms, the psalm of death. And this, uh, with these words here are found in the oldest psalm, which is called the psalm of death, and that was written by Moses, uh, probably at the, possibly at the end of his life, that's Psalm 90. And he says regarding Israel, for all our days are passed away in thy wrath. And we spend our years as a tale that is told. The day of our years are threescore years and ten, seventy. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, that's eighty, yet doesn't make any difference. Is there strength and labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. And then you have the psalm of life, the psalm of death, and psalm 90, psalm 90, then the psalm of life, is Psalm 91. Uh, my favorite scripture verse here, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge 
and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Then you have special event psalms. Uh, the Exodus psalm depicted a psalmist uh, writing depicting the Exodus. When Israel went out of Egypt, the sea saw it and fled. Jordan was driven back. So here he has uh, in mind when God rolled the waters of the Red Sea back to let Israel out of the land of bondage, and then the waters later on, 40 years later, of the Jordan River to let his people into the land of a blessing. And so Psalm 114 has often been referred to as the Exodus Psalm. And then the Babylonian captivity Psalm, Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. That's the Babylonian captivity. That's a funeral song. But then uh, 70 years later, you have the return from the Babylonian captivity that's Psalm 126, and it's a rejoicing psalm. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was her mouth filled with laughter and her tongues with singing. Then there is the coming great tribulation psalm. I think uh, some believe that Psalm 46 refers to this. Uh, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. And then in this, God will speak to the Jews and Gentiles saved during the great tribulation in that same psalm. Be still, in spite of the fact that the whole world is collapsing in on itself, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. The coming great tribulation, then the coming great millennium. Various psalms, I quote here from Psalm 42, For God is king over all the earth. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth make a no loud noise to him. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with trumpet, etc. For he cometh to judge, and we could add, and bless the earth. So these are special event psalms. And then daily psalms. You have the morning psalm in uh, Psalm 51. My voice shall thou hear in the morning. Then the evening psalm, Psalm 4. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. So David prayed morning and evening. And then you have psalms that we have referred to as the distress psalms, uh, especially Psalm 42 and 43, where he asks the same question, the psalmist, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? But thank God he answers his question both times with the correct answer, hope thou in God. I shall yet praise him. And then you have faith psalms, so many of these. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. And uh, the psalmist says, when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord and have courage. Trust in the Lord. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Commit thy way unto the Lord, and he shall bring it to pass. So faith does all these things. These are the faith psalms. Then you have the protection and uh, deliverance psalms. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore thou art for thy name's sake. Lead me and guide me. And you have revival psalms. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? You have family psalms. Lost children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of his youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Well, I only had one and have one in my quiver, my son, Matthew. But uh, family-related psalms. And then the Davidic covenant, where God promises David that he will give him an everlasting kingdom, and that's in Psalm 89. A fellowship Psalms 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And the psalmist has a, a way with the word here. Notice how he describes this uh, unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, 
that went down to the skirts of his garments. And uh, then he says, as the dew of Hermon, that's the highest mountain in the Middle East, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. And so he, 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 he likens this unity among believers as uh, precious oil and as the life-giving dew. And then you have relationship psalms. You have the psalm, uh, for example, the relationship of the good shepherd to his flock. Uh, you have the psalm of the good shepherd, uh, where Jesus says that I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Then you have the psalm of the great shepherd, where the book of Hebrews says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep. And then you have the chief shepherd, and Simon Peter describes him. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth away. So relationship psalms, you have the relationships of the shepherd to his flock. Jesus is our good and our great and our chief shepherd. And then you have the relationship of the son to the father. Uh, no less than five intimate conversations between the father and the son are recorded in these five Psalms. And the five Psalms are Psalm 2, 40, 45, 102, 110. Would you like to overhear a conversation between the father and son? Well, you may not be able to overhear it, but you can read it here. And uh, in these five Psalms, uh, we hear, we see they relate to the creative work of Christ, his e earthly obedience, his anointing, his victory at Armageddon, and his eternal priesthood. Uh, his creative work, and that's in, in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, where the Father, the words of the Father to the Son, and then his, uh, earth, his earthly obedience in Psalm 40, where he leaped over the ivory palaces of heaven. Apparently, the first words that the Son said to the Father, he said, as he joined himself to uh, the uh, little fetus that would begin to grow within the, uh, the, the, the womb of Mary, uh, he said, sacrifice an, off <clears throat> sacrifice an offering, that <clears throat> this is the words of the, the Son to the Father, thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. So this was the conversation that took place between the Father and Son, even prior to, or perhaps at the moment, at the Bethlehem birth, and even before that maybe. And then his anointing uh, with the Holy Spirit, his victory at Armageddon, and then his eternal priesthood. Now here you have God speaking to his son with these words in Psalm 110. The Lord, that's the Father, said unto my Lord, that's David's Messiah, Jesus, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So you have uh, various uh, relationship psalms here that we've talked about, and all these psalms relate to the attributes and the sovereignty, the majesty of God himself. I think of the song, this is one of President uh, Franklin Roosevelt's, uh, one of his favorite psalms, and song, O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Before the hills in order stood, our earth received her frame. From everlasting, thou art God, to endless years the same. Time, like an ever-rolling stream, bears all its sons away. They fly forget forgotten as a dream, dies at the opening day. But that's not true with the believer. Well, thank you for listening to this section on the Psalms, beginning with the attributes of Psalms, winding up with the relationship Psalms.